Trump's particular brand of chaos might seem unique, but there's one man who arguably deserves even more credit than the president for Trumpism. That man is Steve Bannon, Trump's campaign CEO turned former White House chief strategist and the architect of some of Trump's most controversial policies. Now he's the subject of a new film by Academy Award winning documentarian and Cambridge native Errol Morris. It's called American Dharma. And the reason we're not showing you a clip here is because the film doesn't have a distributor yet. We'll get to that. But we do have the man behind it. Tell us what we're missing. Errol Morris, good to see you. Who promotes a movie that no one can see? It's exact. It's a very good point. W why'd you pick Ben? Uh, I've made a series of films about people who have had a destructive effect on America, in my opinion. Um, very important political figures: Donald Rumsfeld, Robert McNamara. Uh, Bannon fascinates me. So is this part, it's interesting, as I'm watching it, I'm saying to myself, I guess I'm not the only one, Fog of War, uh, Unknown Known, uh, is this part three of the trilogy, or did you not see it that way when you're doing it? I didn't see it that way when I was doing it, but why not? Why not? So I, you weren't here for this prior discussion. We were talking about whether the president really believes what he says or even knows when he says something that, that's untrue, that it is untrue. Does, does the pie, The pie graph. Did... <laughs> What part is ingenuous, part, what part is self-deceived, what part is lying? Well, let's apply that graph to S Steve Bannon. Does he believe, when he said, for example, I think in the earlier part of the film, I think you said, is uh, President Trump corrupt? And he said, no. Does he believe that, or is he just playing a part? The question I had to ask myself repeatedly, uh, does this man believe what he's saying? Is he a true believer? Is he an ideologue? Is he a snake oil salesman peddling some kind of ideology? What'd you it, conclude? I, I don't think they're very simple answers. There's, uh, again, it's the pie graph. Uh, I think they're elements of both. But yeah. I, would, I would lean towards the snake oil salesman. Yeah, and I'll tell you why I did too. I didn't, how many hours did you spend interviewing, by the way? Mm. 15, 20, something like okay, that. Okay, well, I've spent no hours, but I'm watching him sitting across from you uh, uh, in his army jacket with his carefully grown stubble, and to me, performing a part. I mean, he wanted to look a certain way, act a certain way, which at least to me suggests somebody who is playing a part, who is selling snake oil. Is that an unfair leap to make or no? No. Fine, let's move on from that then. You know, my favorite moment in the film... That was a simple answer. What well, was a simple answer? My favorite moment in the film is uh, uh, the, the Lucifer thing, the Paradise Lost thing. Can you describe that little moment when you say that there's a line that you consider to be Bannon-esque? What is that line and what's the exchange like? Well, how many people that I've interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot of people I over the that. years, happily compare themselves to Satan? Um, I would say... Nobody, except Steve Bannon. I quote this line from Milton's Paradise Lost. I would rather uh, reign, reign in, hell. in hell than serve in heaven. And uh, I start the line, and Steve Bannon finishes it and says that's one of my favorite lines. I, I really thought it was also when he was happiest in the whole film, by the way. It's not just that it was one of his favorite lines. He just seemed to settle in that this is who I am, which is what you thought when you quoted it to him. Is that not so? It is so. You know, uh, although the happiest moment in the entire film for him, for him was is some found footage of him at the second debate. They have all of the Clinton accusers out there. Uh, there's Donald Trump. And as they usher the reporters into the room, you see Bannon smiling with glee, a kind of sadistic glee. And he created that scenario and the fact that I think you said that Clinton, Bill, as in Bill, had to walk by them, did he not, to shake Melania's hand? Am I not right about that? Indeed, it's in the movie. So, uh, you know, I, most people don't know, I actually did and I have no idea why, that he's a pretty prolific filmmaker himself. And there are a bunch of films that matter a lot to him. Did he pick the films, by the way, or did you? He picked them. So 12 O'Clock High is an example, which I assume a lot of people watching in the great Gregory Peck role. Is it General Savage? Is that, is yes, that the name? Yes, it does, is. Does he think 
He thinks he is General Savage. I mean, there's a scene where Savage basically says to his men, I hope I get this pretty right, uh, pretty close to right, uh, your mission or your function or your something may be to die. And then he leaves the stage. Consider yourselves dead. Yeah. Before you even go on the mission. Bannon thinks he is General Savage, does he not? Or some character, maybe the Dean Jagger character, but some character out of the movie on a mission. On a mission to bring America to victory, but a bombing mission over Nazi Germany. How do you uh, compare how you felt about him before? You hadn't met him before, correct? Before this thing no. happened. How do you compare what you thought about Steve Bannon before you met him to how you felt after you spent those 20 hours interviewing him? Interesting. Smart. Uh, if he has an ideology it became increasingly clear to me that the ideology didn't make very much sense. You make that pretty clear in the film, too. Do you have a better understanding of why Trump won and why Hillary Clinton lost after having spent all this time with this man? Yes. What is it? Um, I don't like conspiracy theories. I, I don't know. But? What's wrong with me? But? I live here in America. I should love <laughs> conspiracies, but I don't. And? Um, I think history is chaotic. It's crazy. One of the things that really fascinates me about 2016 and the election, one of the darkest events for me in my lifetime, um, is how they were able to intertwine Hillary's emails with Anthony Weiner's picks, how does something like that happen? Didn't Bannon say to you that's the moment he knew when he achieved that with the press, that's the moment he knew Donald Trump was going to win? Didn't he say that? He knew that, the deplorable speech. Um, they uh, were armed to do combat with both of the Clintons. Uh, to what end, it's not clear. To the end of just simply winning or putting your candidate in office. Uh, what did he do? Did he have any clear idea of, of who this man was and what would happen next? Uh, this is such a frightening time. It's a frightening time for America. I'll tell you what I think is a frightening time is you can't get a distributor for this film. I have a theory. What's yours? Let me hear your theory first. Your theory is uh, just like uh, the, uh, the uh, censorship crowd told uh, David Remnick at The New Yorker, you should uninvite uh, Steve Bannon from your event. Uh, they've decided to uninvite your film because they don't want Steve Bannon to get any oxygen in the room. Is that a theory you subscribe to? I think it's more complex than that. I think people are afraid of distributing a movie about Steve Bannon because they will incur some horrible criticism as a result. I think it's important, of course it's self-serving me to say so, I think it's important that we deal with many of the issues discussed in this movie. Well, it's not self-serving for me to say the exact same words. Earl Morris, another great film. Thanks so much. Thank you. Distribute that film. And if you want to see American Dharma, you can catch it this Friday at the Harvard Film Archive in Cambridge. It starts at 7 p.m. For more information, go to library.harvard.edu.